Okay. Um, let's see who's here. Let's see. So panel discussion. So please hey, tell us hi, hi. philosophical <laughs> questions, debates. Like pip versus combat, which one to use? Yeah. And the same can be said for instructors from the other Zoom meetings and so on. Everyone's welcome to come here today. I'll be right back. Hello. So what question would provoke the most debate? I guess that's not the direction we want to go or? Well, I first want to invite everyone to write in the HackMD. Yeah. So we have now a header in the, in the HackMD called panel discussion. So if you have a question, you would like us to to discuss or just a question to us um, and it can be like philosophical put them there and, uh, and we will see it there is one question uh, about what ide do people use mm. well we could do a quick round yeah. what do the instructors use what do you use uh, richard if you want to create a serious python package so i use emacs from the console for basically everything. You know Emacs. And uh, how about you, Thomas? Um, yeah, I already wrote it there. I'm, I'm coming from Java. Mm -hmm. I'm essentially using Eclipse, um, installed PyDev on Eclipse and yeah. use that at the moment. That's but a... it has its troubles. It sometimes shows errors that are not there. Mm. <laughs> What's like, more, uh, yeah, they, this is this can't be imported, um, but you can run it. What's your <laughs> problem? <laughs> we have Jarno, what do you use? Um, well, for editing text and actually often for Git as well, I use Atom. Um, but for running anything, um, I, I run them in the terminal, right? so I'm not really using it as an IDE in that sense. Mm. Just do things. Yeah. So is is this the same stuff you use when you do really scientific analysis, or when you used to do scientific analysis? But I'm not... Yeah. Yeah. It is. Oh, and um, the original question was about Windows. Um, I was using hmm. Windows um, mostly. Um, it's now a couple of years ago, but then I was using VS Code and basically in exactly the same way as Atom because they are almost clones of each other. Yeah, that's true. Let, let's finish up the round. Uh, Radovan, you're next on my uh, Zoom panel list. Yes. What do you use? Um, so I use Vim most of the time, sometimes the Visual Studio Code. Vim or Vim? So when do you use Visual Studio Code and when do you use Vim? Do you, um, do you sort of like when you, when you do something quick, you use Vim, or when you get really serious, you edit, you open Visual Studio Code? Or? A little bit depending on the mood and um, Visual Studio Code. If I'm if I don't have to open many many different files, somehow I'm I'm quicker navigating in the terminal, and I'm using I'm using a tiling window manager. So if I need to see many things at the same time, I go for Vim. <laughs> if I just want to see like one one thing at a time, I go for VS Code. <laughs> uh, what I really like about VS Code is the language server, so that it can like auto correct or it can show me typos and mistakes while I'm typing. I, I do like that. Yeah, that is really useful. I think whatever editor you use, I think all the editors we've discussed support this in one way or another. But yeah, you should always have this. Always have the, the, the editor live check your code if you made a typo in a variable name or something that the editor itself will already put a red line under it. That will save you so much time. Or yeah, syntax also, errors. Or syntax, mm -hmm. yeah, these or other types of things. Yeah, and it will also show you when you import something and you are not actually using it. So and not even it doesn't have to be wrong, but it shows you code that is not used yeah. and not needed. You can delete. You can make it as pedantic if you want to. Yeah. So Show, showing what's not what's not being used is actually quite useful because it sometimes shows you that you forgot to use something. Yes. <laughs> or you mistyped something. Or <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wait. Yeah, especially to show that it's not used and it and you thought you used it and yeah. it's, uh, actually it's not. It's, hmm. Yeah. So how about you, Simo? What do you use when you... Yeah, you I'm, a I'm like a Vim guy, but I, I use this team Uxinator that's a really good tool for managing like multiple team accessions. So basically, oh. like I usually have like, I don't know, like 
10 to 20 like team sessions that are basically like the team Uxinator will set up multiple windows and multiple panels and uh, multiple editors and whatever I want open. So that way I can easily manage like different uh, desktops basically, but but in, in a shell. Right. But yeah, so, like, so you're basically running five Vims at the same time in different panels. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> on the background, and uh, then I just connect to them and go right. back. I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the best way of working. Like I, I but I, I just like I started working before like they were good ideas. Like I used mm -hmm. uh, Eclipse in the day, like, and it was crap uh, in my opinion. Like I, I didn't <laughs> like it at least. So, but uh, now nowadays the ideas look much better, but. But it's the learning curve is too big to change, so it's <laughs> you're you're yeah. invested now in yeah the, yeah that's that's the problem like multiple yeah, terms reminds me of what Richard said just before we started the lesson. Richard said anything is possible if you have enough monitors. So <laughs> bigger, you just open up more windows when you don't have space anymore. You just keep adding monitors to your machine, and then <laughs> all be good. Should we go on to, or separate? Well, I want to know Sabri. Yeah, we have a lot <laughs> yeah. more questions here, so we should continue. Yeah, okay. Quickly, Sabri, what, what do so, you? So uh, interesting. So I'm not a Python programmer. My uh, Python involvement is mostly debugging. Um, mm -hmm. So usually it involves a lot of uh, committing out code. So I could debug certain things. So yeah. Vim is very helpful in that. You could commit out multiple lines at the same time. Yeah. Uh, when I was young and brave, I used to use PyCharm, but uh, not any. Like I don't program anymore. Uh, and most of my test cases are just bash one-liners for Python. Mm. So I'm not yeah. a programmer in that sense. <clears throat> that sounds a lot like a lot of my practical work too. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm what? seeing some instability in the HackMD, so um, I will copy out all of the binder session. Um, okay. Don't be alarmed. Okay. Um, it might jump a little bit. Oh, I mean, all um, of the packaging lesson. Yeah. Okay. What What question so, do we want to tackle next? Efficient way to start learning a new uh, language. Yeah. I always do a project. Do a project. Yeah. Yeah. I think everybody agrees. You, you should have a, pro a project that you care about. So not a to-do list or something, or like an example project, like, like an actual thing you actually want to build. And it can be, and, and it can be many reasons why you want to build it. Either you need it for, for something, or it is just super cool, or it is extremely funny, or it is extremely silly. Um, but any reason that, that you have to really want to build it. Yeah. Because then you're investing. Toy examples from your own field are always fun and... Yeah. Or little simulations, games, things like that. That works. So there's yeah. a side question regarding this. People time to time come up with uh, um, buzzwords like you know Python is good, Rust is good, C is for good for this. Uh, you know, different people have different opinion. Um, but uh, let's say um, if you want to do something, if you want to achieve something with Python, you could do that. Let's say. There are other um, supporting packages like, you know, you can use uh, Cython, for example, if you want to incorporate something else. Uh, but just because uh, someone asks, says that they are very passionate about this thing, it doesn't mean that it will suit you. So you don't have to learn a new language in order to achieve something, in my opinion. So you could, there's always option in yeah. all the languages to a certain extent. I would also say it's also a question of what you consider learning a new language. Because I doubt that you will ever know everything about a language, particularly uh, every package, because packages appear and appear and appear. And you can understand basic and concepts. And for that, it really doesn't matter what project you start. Um, it could actually help looking at some rather recent code because newer features and stuff are often not present in, in older, older things. Or if you start, you will miss a couple of, or if you start with a completely new project, you will likely miss features um, that, are, that were only introduced recently. At the same time, you can argue, if you don't use them, your code is more compatible to, uh, to older systems. But yeah, yeah, there's always the trade-off on knowing a language 
um, in my opinion, if, if you know one language well, it's easy to get into code of, a, of another language if it's well documented. If it's not well documented, it doesn't matter, really matter whether you know the language. Yeah. I really like that that statement you just made. That know one language well. I think that's important. So don't. I think it's better to know one language well than twenty languages only a little bit. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you know one language well and then you know twenty languages a little bit, that's fine. It may actually enrich your one language. But yeah, it's the same for any tool. Also with with, with the editors, know one text editor, but know it well. Mm -hmm. Pick, pick um, one. I, so with programming, I would say that, that you, you should probably know two languages at least reasonably well. One typed, one untyped. Yeah. Okay. 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 So or one more for scripting, one more for hmm? uh, compiled <laughs> yeah. and interpreted, which yeah. is mostly the same thing, yeah, or one. fast and easy, which <laughs> is also mostly the same thing. Yeah. I see some questions here. When should I start migrating to Julia? And good answer like c julia replaces c rather than python yeah. is that any comments about that it's not replacing c it's not a systems yeah, programming it, language it's not really right so well, julia is maybe, i maybe. guess more replacing fortran than c even because it's it's not I mean, it, it's not really replacing anything, but it's intended to be yeah. to make it easy to write fast code for computational tasks. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not for systems programming. You don't write the Linux kernel in Julia. No. Um, and it's also at the moment. I mean, it will probably get a good library uh, ecosystem um, slowly over time, but Python is ahead of it, so it doesn't have the same library ecosystem mm -hmm. as Python. But I always if, thought that was the ambition of Julia to be an even better is, language is, for yeah. data analysis than Python already is. Yeah, yeah. but Python is way more general yeah. um, than just data analysis um, and computation. Yeah. So, um, so, I mean, I would say if you're starting a new project and you know it, if it, computational efficiency will be important, then looking into Julia makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I, no, I, I disagree with that. Uh, because the with uh, so with Python, the thing about Python is how you use it is that you use Python as a glue language to glue together mm -hmm. different like super well optimized things. Like NumPy uh, is super well organized. It's super fast. It's way faster than C. It's it's uh, it's 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 well, it's just as fast as Julia because Julia uses the same sort of underlying code. But you just use Python to just glue together NumPy statements, for example. And when you need more performance, I mean, if you get into packages like PyTorch and TensorFlow and Dosk and like this Apache, I mean, you just use, Python itself is super slow as a language, but you use it to glue together this high performance thing. So if you have something that really needs computational power, you, you drop down. And I think even Julia will do the same and many other languages actually do the same. Um, okay, so if you, if you need to write it yourself, or if you are combining enough um, NumPy statements, then Julia will be faster. Yes. Um, but yeah, um, if you can do it in NumPy reasonably well, then um, um, it's a toss up really. Um, either language will be more or less yeah, like, fast. Like with the with Julia, like nowadays there's already starting to be like a really good ecosystem of, of different libraries for numerical calculations, like different differential equ equation solvers and uh, like uh, automatic differentiation all kinds of like advanced stuff that you can do like gpu solvers and, and things like that but they're still like very low level so like if i would have, have a project and i need to do like machine learning or something like i need to do like a, yeah definitely uh, like a you know, yeah. kernel ve vector machine so something like that i i don't necessarily want to start from the low level library codes like like calculating some differential equations or solvers or gradient boosting or something i i just want to use the the actual thing that calculates what i need to do and for that i would probably use something like ski git learn of course there's similar kinds of libraries for julia but i would have to like make them compete with each other like with the features that they have and like uh basically it's like if you like you need to look at what point of the ecosystem you want to basically jump in like if you want to do low level stuff julia already has a very good 
foundation mm-hmm. and there's upcoming really good machine learning packages and stuff like that on Julia. But it's like different tools for different uh, situations. And if you know that you're going to be doing like low level stuff and you don't want to do C necessarily, for example, then I'd say Julia is like, I'd guess better, I'd, I'd say a better option. Yeah. I mean, if you can are considering C for... Uh, can we move on we move? to other questions? <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> there was some... can, I have a, can I have a short uh, comment about, because we work on yeah. these HPC systems, uh, regarding Julia and uh, Python and other languages, badly written, Julia would run slower than a well-written Python. Uh, but Julia, I think, is providing more uh, support for like uh, multi-processing and uh, for HPC systems. Um, so, but you have, to, you have to do it properly. Yeah. Go ahead, Richard. Um, at the same time, um, one more thing, uh, Radwan and Richard and others, there were some questions about what this code refinery is. So please uh, remind to sort of introduce it at the end yeah. before we forget. So ideally in a few minutes, we'll have an outro and someone can summarize these kind of things like what comes next and so on. And also we can continue some of these discussions in the after party in Zoom, which will be pasted I guess it might be in the bottom of HackMD. Yeah, it's in the bottom of HackMD and the Twitch chat. So once the stream ends, join there and we can keep talking. Oh, uh, what about, I'd like this question, what about copyright issue? So when you share code, someone might use it without referring to you. Um, any comments on that? That's the same uh, as I wrote. That's the same as any copyright issue. Um, if you have a license file in uh, set in there, or even if you don't, um, if they copy it, yeah, um, they make themselves liable or for lawsuits. Uh, potentially, if you actually do it open source with um, respective licenses, and this becomes something bigger on their side, uh, you might actually get uh, support by open source foundations and similar things to actually pursue your lawsuit. Um, which, yeah, is better than you sitting there um, uh, not doing anything. And if you're not, if you're not making it open source, okay, uh, what do you do with the code? Yeah. I mean, I think maybe we can talk about the benefits versus the disadvantages. So someone might do something bad, but if it's not open, in effect, no one's going to use it or cite it at all. So then like i mean after being in the open source community for a while you start seeing the benefits and it's sort of a strategic thing so you can talk with someone and sort of find the right balance for your own projects if you are really afraid of somebody copying your code and sort of using it to get ahead of you before your publication you can always publish your code after you publish the results yeah. mm-hmm. That's what I usually do with these things. I first publish and then I, I open source everything. Mm-hmm. Let me include a short uh, license lesson next time. Yeah, we talk about that in Code Refinery a little bit, but it could sure deserve more mm, yeah. conversation. Uh, the, my, my problem with talking too much in depth uh, about the licenses is that um, I think you would need some kind of lawyer to actually give a more educated statement on them. I think all of the people here can give the general statement uh, from what we've seen, these licenses are okay, these licenses are a little bit more permissive than the other, but yeah, it's a bit, you know, yeah, that's that my... A, that is an interesting point actually, yeah, because we were invited, the, the software people of at University of Oslo, to give a lecture at the law faculty about licensing at some point. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> because it seems every time a lawyer speaks about license, people don't understand anything. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So we have to be simple about, we have to be simple about license. It's not the, like the fine print and lot of text. It is about the permissibility. It is about the freedom. Exactly. So you have to have simple license and adapt existing license, not to write your own. Yeah. And like so getting benefit, like how do you choose the right license to get the benefit you need? Once I heard this yeah. joke, if you don't want to open something, email your university and ask if you're allowed to, and it'll be some <laughs> some co- so complex you will never get an answer and you won't open it. If you want to open it, then just do it. So that might summarize the lawyer versus 
us yeah. debate pretty well. Or at least that's my philosophy. Yeah. I think I think mm. one general advice: don't try to write your own license. Oh, that's a definitely good not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. I say yeah. maybe there's like several main categories. There's either uh, viral, which is if someone modifies it, then it has to also be equally open, or non-viral, where if someone uses it, they don't have to make the results open. And yeah. these, well, there's far more, someone here is going to say there's far more to it than that, but um, that's sort of the I think that's one of the main point. distinctions. Yeah, that is yeah. one important distinction. You know. Okay. Um, and viral also means that um, others cannot take um, others cannot change the license. So essentially, it allows you yeah. to profit from the code even if you publish it open source. Can I have a comment there? Go ahead. Yeah. So I, would, it, I think it's good to 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 remember that I think licensing is one thing, but licensing will not guarantee that I get more citations or not. So for me, licensing is one thing, but making it easy to cite is a different thing. I mean, the one yeah. thing can help the other, but um, yeah. I would like the recommendation is make it easy to cite it, and most people will actually cite it, and most people will not do anything bad with yeah. it. Yeah, copyright is completely different from citations. If you don't distribute it, then copyright has nothing to do with that. So it's scientific integrity that says you need to acknowledge people which you build off of. And yeah. So, so Richard, uh, in the okay. sysadmin point of view, there's this interesting question about processes. Do you have time um, to say something about it? I, yes. the uh, Apple M1 processors. Yeah, so this um, yeah. So this comes with this uh, different architecture. So we have different, uh, like very uh, main architectures, x86, X AMD. Uh, so those things, uh, when we talk about this Conda and PIP, if you, if you remember that there was this uh, during the dependency lesson, NumPy 1.13 failed when I installed because it's tried to install from source. So in ARM, you will feel uh, see this a lot because the, the pre-compiled uh, packages are like there are, the NumPy would be there, but there are much less uh, packages for ARM, but it's building up. Um, so there's this initiative called uh, European Processor Initiative where the Europe going to produce its own processor and ARM is going to be the um, like the, the architecture. Mm. So I would think uh, in the future we have to, so when you uh, when you distribute code, let's say if you if you want to distribute it in Conda or like uh, in Python, in Python uh, I, I would recommend you also provide this ARM version if you can. <clears throat> I would like to have one, but my bank account doesn't like me to have one. Uh, yeah, so I'm, they are very cheap. You're like uh, cheap uh, ARM you don't have to buy a Mac. Um, I don't know, compile it to Raspberry Pi. Yeah. yeah. Should we have a quick alter now in some of the summary points?